You know, I don't own any like classic first editions. Like, what does it smell like? Ooh, like a <coughs> musty bookstore. Yeah. Oh, hello. I'm Joel Stein. Every time I see someone interviewed from their home, I want them to get their head out of the way so I can see the bookshelf behind them. Do they organize them alphabetically? By color? The Dewey Decimal System? Did they even read these books? These are the kind of questions we're gonna ask on Show Your Shelf. And today's guest is Mikel Jolet, a friend of mine who I thought was just like me. But then I read his amazing new memoir, Hollywood Park, and realized that Mikel and I are nothing alike. He grew up in a cult, he had to raise and kill rabbits to feed his family. He became a rock star as the lead singer of the Airborne Toxic Event, which is named after Don DeLillo's White Noise. So he's also more literary than I am. Mikel is an artist, and I can't wait to see his bookshelf to find out how even a bookshelf can make me feel less cool. Show your shelf, show some spine. Dust off your tiny jackets, show me yours, I'll show you mine. We're delighted to have you with us. Perhaps we appear pretentious, but we're sincerely here to share the wealth. So show your shelf, show your shelf, show your shelf. Welcome. We're here with Mikel Jolet, the author of Hollywood Park and the uh, lead singer, uh, frontman, I'm just going to say frontman of the Airborne Toxic Event. Thank you so much for doing this. So is this the main bookshelf in your house or I feel like I'm in- Oh no, we have so many more bookshelves upstairs. We have three other full bookcases, floor to ceiling upstairs. This is sort of like my to read. This is kind of like my summer. Um, Station Eleven and Normal People and Wool and Fifth Season. Flamethrowers, Rachel Kushner. Going after Cacciato, which is Tim O'Brien. He's one of my favorite authors. But up here is sort of like where most, which this camera can see, um, is where most of the books, a lot of the books that I read during the course of writing the memoir. Can you show us that shelf? This is what, can you give us what we like to call a shelfie? So this shelf um, I built um, on the anniversary of my father's birthday um, after he died. I, I'd like to do some sort of like, you know, project uh, on his birthday every year. So this is a piece of uh, found barn wood um, from a 19th century barn in Ohio. I got it at a wood store in Sun Valley. Grab one of those at random. Um, Notes from the Underground, Dostoevsky. This book is very influential in my uh, late 20s. I write about this in the book. I used to have this book taped to my wall. What do you get out of pasting pages to a wall? It wasn't pages. I would paste the whole book. And it felt like, um, I don't know, like the like they were a part of my writing space and they were, you know, hanging out with me. I just did a lot of stuff where it was like, this is a creative space, we're gonna break rules, so whatever breaks the rule is how we want the space to feel. Alice Munro, I've read, I think I've read almost every word Alice Munro's ever written. And what's great about Alice Munro is it, you start off and you think the book's about one thing and then about a third of the way, or sorry, the short story's about one thing and then about a third of the way you're like, it's not about that at all, it's about the guy in the diner. Or it's not about the guy in the diner, it's about his dad. Or it's not about this lover, it's about the next lover that shows up after the first lover left. Like, she always has this little head fake for you. But other than the stories, what is it about the way that she writes that you like so much? She probably is like the best sentence writer. If Philip Roth is the best paragraph writer, just purely lyricism, I think, you know, Alice Munro might be the best sentence writer. Uh, and then all the Franzen books. I love all the Franzen books. I don't know if that makes me a boring Gen X white dude, but I just love Jonathan Brandon. He's just a great writer. Um, all right, that's my shelf. We asked you to pick books that were meaningful to you. The first book you picked was Toni Morrison's Beloved. Beloved, absolutely. Probably my favorite book. Your fa oh, you quoted at the beginning of your book. That's the, the epigram. It's, it, it, it taught me a lot, this book. I, I think I read this book four times in the last three years. And I think this is actually the, one of the few books, like I said, that I actually wrote in. Uh, like I would write little notes and stuff. I think. Wait, what have you written in there? What do you see? How does it feel? Put me in the water in every scene. Put me in the black water. I think it's because I'm talking about the part of the book where we're seeing Beloved's perspective and it's very strange. And so one of the notes I put said was, put me in the black water. What was lost? What was felt? What do you see? How does it feel? Put me in that water in every scene. Wait, what are you trying to tell yourself there? Like, let it be as strange and mysterious and complex as it is in your own mind, as it was in your own mind, as you understood it at the time, as you understand it now, as it's being unfolded, uh, as it's unfolding for you. And that that complexity is, is where the story's at. It's exactly that complexity. And, you know, the other thing with Toni Morrison is just, she's like Roger Federer or, you know, I don't know, Michael Jordan or 
Einstein or something. Where there's just no holes in her game. She's great at story and she's great at like lyrical writing and she's great with character and she writes these beautiful sentences, but it's also relatable. I just love her as a writer. I just, and I'm glad I didn't get to her until later in life. I don't think I would have been able to appreciate her at, at 22. You only read this a few years ago. Yeah, I, the first time I read this was probably three years ago. And that's, that's kind of late in life to have a book make that much of an impact on you. No, that's what I mean. I mean, like, I'm really thankful. I don't think I would have understood it 20 years ago. I don't think I had the basis of humanity. I don't think I had the empathy. And like now I felt like there's like a visceral, like, oh my God. And you I just, I'm in to... such awe of her as a writer. If you feel comfortable, would you um, read that part of Beloved that you use as the epigram? Should I just read it from my book? Oh, the glasses. The hipster glasses. These were my father's glasses, thank you very much. Oh, really? From the 70s. Yeah, and I had them fit with my prescription. This is from Beloved, but it's what opens uh, the first section of my book. Some things you forget, other things you never do, but places are still there. If a house burns down, it's gone, but the place, the picture of it stays. And not just in my re-memory, but out there in the world. What I remember is a picture floating around out there outside my head. I mean, even if I don't think it, even if I die, the picture of what I did or knew or saw is still out there, right in the place where it happened. You know, to some extent that place is your memory. You know, this is, this is a really big idea for Marilyn Robinson and Gilead, that like you're constructing the world uh, in your own memory and similar like that your, your sort of model for, for God or perhaps God's model for you is, is your is your deceased ancestors and you can visit them by um, recreating them um, in your prayers uh, and in some cases I guess your writing. The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. I love this book. So I have this apparently false memory of reading The Things They Carried. I had remembered that it was a chapter of fiction and every other chapter was nonfiction in which he said that wasn't true but it's emotionally true here are the actual facts, which I think he does once or twice, right? He right. does that a couple of times. Um, and, he, and, and then he says, also, that's not true. Or it is. And he has a great line. He says, the best war stories aren't even real. Wait, what does that mean? A true war story has to contain lies or else it's not going to be accurate to the soldiers that tell it. Because the truth doesn't really convey what it felt like. I mean, I don't, I don't adopt the perspective that he adopts in the book. No this idea that you have in memoir that you're just going to just get the facts make it objective and get out of the way and like fuck that but you're really careful with the facts but it it does feel like fiction in that you you go from one memory to another and from place to place and you imagine things my argument is that the things that we consider to be devices of fiction unreliable narrators and metaphor uh, magical realism, that these aren't the devices of fiction. These are the devices by which we construct ourselves. This is the device by which we construct our identities. And so if you're going to write a book about your experience in the world, which is what a memoir is, a memoir is answering the question, like, how was this world experienced for you? Then these exact same things um, are, are fair game. And so my book is filled with lies, not things that didn't happen, but things that like page two, my mother turns into a bird and flies away. Page 100, we're tunneling a thousand feet beneath Hollywood Park and I'm in conversation with the future self and it just sort of happens and it's never dealt with. And I thought this would be a more controversial thing to have done, but everyone just seemed to have gotten that the whole point of it was that it was a, it was a, a memory and dialogue with itself. And that, that's, what I, that's what I was going for with, with the book. So back to the things they carry, what was a moment that really like stuck with you? There's this great story where he talks about going to the Canadian border because he's this honor student, essentially, that's been drafted. He decides he's going to try and dodge the draft, so he goes up to the Canadian border and he meets this old man. He's staying at this lodge. This old man runs and he takes him right on the river, six feet from the Canadian border. He could just jump out, swim across, and he, and he, and he breaks down sobbing. Sobbing. Um, I might have cried a little during this book. He breaks down sobbing because um, he can't, um, he can't do it. He can't bring himself to, to do it. So instead he goes to Vietnam and he, what he says is um, When it came down to it, um, he was more afraid of embarrassment. I feel like I've heard That story of draft dodging, but like how does he really bring you into? What that experience is like? But just he gets to the humanity of it. He gets to like 
all the conflicting emotions that go through his head and then he really probes himself and then he gives you this very intelligent, honest reflection as a reader that you, a conclusion that maybe somewhere in your mind you sort of might have figured out, but he gives it to you so starkly. And I just thought like, that's a standard to reach, you know, you, as a, particularly as a memoirist where you probe this moment of your life, you reflect and you thought, what is the truth of this moment? And not just like what I thought at the time, although that's important too. And not just like, what are the sights and sounds, you know, of, of this scene? Cause that's important too. And even not what's the, what's happening metaphorically. Because that's important too. I feel like you know characters when you know their imagination. So it's important to write about the imagination of your characters because that's how readers get to know. So all three of those things are important. But, but the thing that he does is what's happening ontologically? What does this mean in the arc of your life and your relationship to the universe? What does this moment mean? And so I, I, I tried to remember to write about that in every big scene in my book to do all four of those things. You, you never write with just one of them. You have to. Every scene has to have all four of those of those elements. And he just he landed it so well. What's a scene in your book where you were thinking about like landing all four of those? There's a scene where my brother gets uh, pinned down and beat up by a, a by a bully, um, and he's been you know bullying me for a while. I get to the school, our elementary school, and he's got he's he's on the baseball diamond and he's being pinned down by this much bigger kid he must have been like 11 this kid was 14 he was already kind of going through puberty so he was much bigger than the rest of us and then he he looks at me and he's like you his brother i think i'd said something and i was like yeah he's like every time you talk i'm gonna punch your brother i'm gonna kick your brother and i was like really and he like kicked him and then he, and i was like and i think he thought it was a way to get me to shut up but i was so mad at my brother that i was like well then he says Star Wars is an underrated movie. And I start going up this whole about Star Wars. And he starts beating the shit out of him. And it was like, I became the bully. And I saw that it was in me to become the bully. So how do you use those four techniques to get across all of those feelings? What did it sound like? What did it smell like to, in the dirt? What did my brother's face look like with the blood and the dirt intermingled with his white and yellow jersey? I can still see it. What is happening in my imagination at the time? In my imagination at the time, what's happening is I'm the big guy. I'm the guy that's gonna, you know, now be in charge. And then ontologically what's happening? Meaning what is this in the story of my life? And I think at the part what I wrote was, why is it we can never just have a quiet moment? And maybe the reason he's the bully, then I'm the bully, then he's the bully, then I'm the bully is because, you know, there's never a moment of safety and we're scrapping over a very small bit of dirt. And if we had just had that, we'd have a maybe we would we would be like those other brothers that you see on the playground who are sitting there sharing their lunches because there's an abundance and this is like in their lives there's an abundance there's an abundance of love and there's an abundance of food and there's an abundance of caring parents or educators or whatever and for us there was always a scarcity there was almost never food in the house we had to kill our own dinners we didn't know who our parents even were because we were raised in the orphanage and, and i think it, it one of the things it did was it made us scrap over this small bit of dirt and, and it created this dialectic between us. I was not at all surprised that you picked White Noise by Don DeLillo since you named your band the Airborne Toxic Event after kind of the main plot point in that book. What does your copy of that look like? This is a first edition White Noise that my publisher at Celadon Books, Jamie Robb, gave me when uh, Hollywood Park came out. You know, I don't own any like classic first editions. Like what does it smell like? Ooh, like a <laughs> musty bookstore. Yeah. Like mildew and mites, apparently. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, so this book obviously had a big impact on my life. The idea at the Airborne Toxic event, which is unit two, he gets exposed to a chemical cloud. He realizes he's going to die. And as a result of that realization, his life changes. And of course, the big joke is he goes to the doctor. He's like, Doc, I've been exposed to the chemical cloud. How long do I have? And the doctor says, it might be two days. It might be 50 years. We don't really know, which of course is you know true for everyone. And that was a big thing I went through uh, at that point in my life, becoming very aware of my own mortality. I think a lot of people go through that in their late 20s, like I'm gonna die someday. You know, I, I guess I should get on with shit. You know, I think that's something that happens. So a lot. Why did that strike you? I, I don't remember having that moment. You didn't have that moment? No, I don't. Not till I had a kid. No. Really? Oh, I don't know why. I probably because I spent too much time alone. I didn't have a television. 
<laughs> I also loved how it played with perspective. It's in first person, it's in third person, it's been first person, it's in third person. What do you like about all that perspective switching? I love it when writers do that because it flatters my intelligence as a reader and it gives me something to hunt for. And, you know, uh, it, in some weird way, by not dumbing down the story, the story feels more true. Where do you keep, you just throw it around? I feel like that should be like, I was in someone's house recently and he had, he's very rich. And he had a first edition T.S. Eliot. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it was, but it was like on a stand yeah. on the table when you first entered the New York apartment. I feel like you should do that. I'm not that guy. I, I don't know, I, I just don't think like that. I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know how to think like that. I, don't, I, I actually just love the, the words that are inside. It could be a Microsoft Word document, I don't care. The object of the book doesn't matter to me that much. Maybe you shouldn't have a first edition. <laughs> We sent you a gift. Oh, thank you. It's something I thought represents who you are. I'm actually a little nervous about Me this. Me too. Story. Me too. Uh, I'm also nervous because you seem nervous. So now I'm wondering, like, what does he think is so? Oh, this is great. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, Mark Twain, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Oh, that's great. I what? thought of you as someone who kind of had to raise himself and was very scrappy and had this incredible kind of moral center. This is very, this is much kinder than I, why were you worried about this? This is Miss Mark Twain, come on, there's a. I don't know, it's tough childhood <laughs> stuff. I mean, I clearly, you know, I wrote a whole book about it. The cat's out of the bag. That's Did one of the benefits of writing a memoir, by the way, is that like everyone knows your secrets so you don't really feel like you have anything to hide. <laughs> Thank you for, for doing this. Thank you. This was fun. Are you kidding me? I love this. All these interviews, everyone wants to talk about like the plot of your book. And you're like, okay, but I, that's, I didn't live in the plot. I lived in the writing. So it's nice to be able to talk about your sort of like how you think about reading and writing and all that kind of stuff. I'm so glad. Thank you guys very much. Take care.